I can tell you when I was born, there was twins. Bernadette, Bernadette was my twin sister. And the midwife told my mother to have me christened straight away because I was a little soul for God. Right. You proved her wrong? <laughs> I proved her wrong. I'm still at 686 running around the strand. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. My earliest memory is uh, my dad bringing me in on the carrier of the bike and let me off and we went into uh, the infant's room. There was a lovely lady nun, Sister Eugene, and she knew how to put little kids and everything like that. And that's my earliest memory now. And a big, big open two rooms and a hall. A hall and the hall was for the horse. Yeah. Everyone, everyone supplied a lot of turf. Only, what do you call them, dry toilets? That's all, that's all. You know, all. there weren't flush toilets, there was no running water of any description. No. Mm. Well, we had to walk to school. Yeah. Three or four miles. Yeah. In the bare feet? No, I think we had, yeah, I think I had shoes. I got boots, no, not shoes, boots, and a pair of turned down top stockings with a logo on the top of them. Right, coloured logo on the top of them. And come April, we were glad to get rid of the boots. Oh, yeah, so Very hot. glad. So we went to school in our bare feet. Now, I absolutely loved school. I loved it. When we got holidays, they'd be cheering. You'd hear them miles away cheering when they get holidays. I was the only one who was coming down the road crying uh. because we got the holidays. <laughs> You didn't get long pants. You wouldn't be seen going to school with long pants that time. You'd be left. <laughs> it's a short you pants. wore a short pants. I don't be got to fit you. Mm. I remember the first long pants I went, and my father. I don't know whether it was everyone or not. Used to insist that if you got some a new suit, the first time you'd wear it would be to mass. Why? No, I don't know. That was his idea. You could get a clip from anywhere. <laughs> And could you come home and tell her she got the clip then? Well, you'd come home and tell her, but you get no heat. I know, yeah. <laughs> this fella used to bring a frog and get him in his pocket. Remember that? The rest of the search. Mrs. Mrs. Regan up on the table, McLeod with the frog in his pocket. <laughs> and I'm ashamed of my life. <laughs> and here's a good one. You'd be given a couple of things to do when you go home, homework to call it. And if you haven't it in the morning, you get three or four slaps. Like, so you were nearly in school even when you were in bed. And thinking of going again in the morning to get, hold out your hand again, to cut the hand you your see. We often have bad nights, you didn't hope in the morning that the roof would be gone to school. <laughs> That's what we were. And you couldn't be blamed for it like this. We only treated the same as if you were a dog. You weren't supposed to look out through the window. If you looked out through the window, you'd be nearly assassinated. But it was out of a rule, that was. But if you were treated bad, you're not going to learn. The first ever I heard of algebra was there was Chabris guy who was around my own age. He was going to be Garbelli. She used to keep him back in the evening to give him a grind in algebra. And I usually kept back along with him. That was the first ever I heard of algebra, never heard of it after. Yeah. I ran my own little business after when that, with the education I got anyway. They didn't know how to teach Irish either. That's why I didn't learn Irish. To, to, to be a book, to read an Irish book. And there was another book that you read, this page was Irish and the other side was the English of it. And I was able to read Irish, which I believe I didn't know what I was saying. But doing it all in a lump with only a card. 
Well, there was a teacher that was in me like that time, Mrs. Lochan. She was uh, Mrs. Egan. She yeah. was Bridget Lochan from Stony Road. She'd be a grand aunt of the Lochans up there. She was really a good teacher. Everyone left me to school with algebra and everything. Yeah. That secondary oh, school yeah. education before they left. And we, we, we were going, we had to do the metric system. You know, and, and that time, she says, it's not saying going out, she says, but I'm telling you that's going to come in. That's years and that, was, that was in 1949-50. Do you know what I mean? She was very far seeing. I was also uh, an attendance, a school attendance officer. He came in, if you were missing school, you know, for a week and no reason, okay. um, he'd go to the house and see why, the reason why the child was off for. When we were able to work, once we came home from school, there was always something to be done. Mm. And that was manual labour, but that's what we were able to do. Right? You always had a pitchfork or a spade or something. Pinning turnips and picking potatoes. <laughs> that's what you were called to. <laughs> that was our holiday. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you were nearly glad to go back to school at the uh, times. <laughs> My mother was... She would be a little bit cross. My father wasn't. My father wasn't... Yeah. He was the quiet one of the two, like, you know. Yeah. But, uh, him and I were great, very, very. That's why he used to tell me some stories, you know, and I was sorry that I didn't yeah. listen to him more. He told me quite a lot, like. But. Yeah. When my father and, and mother, I don't think they were slept. Your mother be... never slept, you know? No, I never remember getting slept or seeing them slept in of it. They give an awful right <laughs> And she was for poor Granny Kelly. Oh. She was long, so she reared us nearly. Yes. I mean, she lived with us. My father's mother, she was lovely, she was great. Yeah. Were your parents strict to him? Uh, them would be. My mother more thrown out than my father was. But she was very good, like she was. Especially now when you came into her teens. <gasps> Lord bless us, and you'd be asking to go to uh, Kayleigh. You'd be asking the whole week, and it might be half an hour before to start, it would go. <laughs> <laughs> My brother, Jack, the oldest brother, he used to be dealing on sheep and cattle and everything, and I'd often get, I'd get a note going to the teacher to be allowed to get out maybe at 2 o'clock to walk to Patumna with sheep for the fair the next day. Mm. I didn't look forward to it because sheep on the road, of course there were very few cares at the time now. Mm, yeah. There was no care, very few. Very, very few. But to walk on the sheep by the time we be halfway to Portumna, they'd be their tongue out and they'd be hurt. You wouldn't get a sheep to walk at no Billy. You wouldn't get a man either. <laughs> or a man either. I was only 13 I or 14 years of age at the time and you'd have to bring a bicycle then to cycle home. Mm. We weeded all the, we'd say, the, the crops, turnips and mangles yeah. and bees. And then we'd have to, we'd have to we'd thin them first and then keep the weeds out. And my mother. My mother's parents came from Belfast. They bought that and lived in it. There was Clary's here at the start, before that. The name of Clary's. So, Battle Borden in, and they built to see the porch of this house here. My father had cancer for years. For, it's like you could talk about school and the, the father was coming home in the evening and your father in bed. It, Six or seven years. The, even the doctors couldn't understand how he lasted so long. Roughly going on to 15, maybe, when he died. Would well, have been tough on your, on your mother, I suppose, uh, in particular, at the time, with, with, with five, five, five kids, is it? Aye. Five, uh... Yes. She died there in 1985. Like that, she lost the walk. She was. It was six or seven years, I was the main miner, like. I was miner for... It can be very trying, but it went on and on anyway. She would be right, she should have been in a nursing home. Or you'd be just asleep at night then, and you'd walk up again, and so that had to wear you out. Mm. It passed and gone anyway. My mother was born in Belfast. Right. Eddie brought her to Belfast the only time she ever went back in 1964. She was 65 or so at the time. That's another force from the same 
the same time, like. And everyone nearly had their own food. The biggest item you had to buy was tea and sugar. <laughs> you had your own milk, you turned, you had your own butter, you made your own bread, all homemade bread. You had your own eggs. They were self-sufficient because they had their own potatoes, their own corn. Geese and ducks and hens and yeah. Tur yeah. turkeys. The turkeys were sold. The geese were killed. Now it is nearly the opposite way. Uh, the orchard was the best thing to eat. Now the apples are falling down and no one to eat them yeah. or pick them or look at them. We had um, a vegetable garden. We had apple trees. And your own plums and apples and gooseberries or whatever. <laughs> Onions and carrots and cabbage. <laughs> yeah. They should love the eel. The eel. Oh, they yeah, hopping on the pen. They say they were alive, but they weren't as funny because they were round. Yeah, they, they were. Happened. <laughs> They were, they liked the eel were lovely. Rabbits were great. Oh, we had loads of rabbits. Daddy used to, the place was full of them. Daddy used to shoot, shoot all the rabbits. Yeah. We used to fight over the kidneys. And there were only two. Remember that? Yeah. We all loved the kidneys. Mm -hmm. Rabbits were very, were very beautiful. And everyone was always snaring them and shooting them, like, you know, until, un, until 54, when the Mixing the horse came and left that no one looked for rabbits. Mm. I wouldn't, I never ate one since. No. We'd have lots of old cabbage in the garden, or right, we'd throw the garden and turn up so grand when they come in along with bacon. Mm. All of the two pigs, like, well, maybe four pigs altogether over the 12 months, we'll call it. Pat Lynch was great for killing and boring the pig. And he was the local butcher. Killed for a good many of the neighbours, but he got no money, but he got a big bag of ribs and bones, right? They know that, you know, coming home. We used to come from school and we'd ask where Daddy was. Mammy said he'd gone to Mass to kill a pig. Oh, goody. <laughs> well, that was the time, John, when the pig was killed. Yeah. The pig, uh, which was t terribly cruel, as you know, when you think of it. The pig was pulled out of the pig house and went screeching and screeching and screeching and put up on a table and there was a, a local man would would stab the pig with a knife in the heart and there'd be someone getting the blood in a, a bucket or a container and the blood would be kept and the puddings would be rinsed and rinsed and rinsed and rinsed and the blood would be poured into the puddings and that was that. That's the way it was drawn. Mm. It was, they say it wasn't a humane way, but sure, yeah. I think with kids so quickly it's really worse now because they know what's happening, the yeah. smell of the blood and everything, yeah. you know. There was probably an act to do in it. To, to, to oh, there was an act, there was, you great with the bone and Right. Like, you know, have a knife and to be like, you could share with it. Like, which was dangerous, but he knew how to use it. Yeah. And the bladder. <laughs> bladder for football. We should blow up the bladder. You could kick it, but you couldn't touch it. That was one of the main tracks at the, the junior ones. That, that we had no football set. <laughs> we won't have a great time kicking it. He put it down in the box and all, he sold it down. And you put straw on the bottom, a layer of pig and salt, salt and then so, uh, straw again. Yeah, another layer and of the pig. same way, salt and straw. So when the war hit, was there much change around locally or was there kind of a worry about it? Or? Didn't seem to be much worry about it or much talk about it either, not, not like now. But things got scared. You were rationed. You got too much tea a week and too much sugar and bread got kind of scared. And and that's it, you were much later. She was younger. She was, she was younger. only a young one at that. Oh, but I remember, I remember the coping books they had. And these, and these you see, there was children in the house then. The young were allowed. It was an ounce of tea per person per week. Anyone that had a family had more of a plint in us. We'd say if there was any mm. two adults in the house that had only two ounces of tea for the week. Or, that's the way it worked. You had to go to the well for the water, bring it in and put it down <laughs> in the top and the pot and warm it. And an open fire now. And do your washing <laughs> in, a, in a big bath, in the bath, in the washboard. <laughs> That's how you washed. <laughs> Could you imagine it? <laughs> you must have had muscles of steel. <laughs> the wash top. <laughs> we were across over the field and there was a, the, the, the well there in the summertime, beside where Myra was. 
my relation, you know, between you and Morris's, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 a river yeah. that like it, the, the great spring. But it was a nice little walk over and back. I remember when, when the spring had come and they cut the turf, all the neighbours would get together. Two hours one, one week, and my hands the next week, and the, the, all the turf was cut. Remember that? Yeah, thing? that's right. You cut the turf, he probably told you that too, in, in Monster Bog, over in Tipperary. You could bring it down, bring the bank in the Shannon, the fire side, to the lint road into the boat, and bring it the turf across the Shannon. See, and it's thrown out at the turf key. You often hear them talking about the turf key. That's why it was known as the turf key. Well, I think one of the earliest things were the most disturbed in my mind was when we got the electricity in 1952. It was, it was I don't know how, how they managed because that time, we say, my mother and my grandmother, they had min socks and the darn socks and they knitted gloves and they knitted socks. And, yeah. We had eye lamp, would stand about that high, you know, and they had a mirror at the back. That was to reflect more light from it. You know, you had nothing before that. You had no water on tap, and you had to get your well soaked and get in your... Well, we got an iron. That's right. That was a good <laughs> red <laughs> Oh, look what... And then you might get a, a wireless and a... Fridge. It took a long time though to get into those things. <laughs> because people had the money, them times. It's there now, yeah. yeah. Do you remember when we got the first radio? All the neighbours, when the matches were coming oh, on, yeah. be all outside the window with the. the, the, with the you'd have a wet battery and a dry battery, and you'd have to carry them in and the handlebars that bike into banner to have them charged. charged. <laughs> Oh, I had to have a wireless ledger. You used to say at the same day, you Eucharist to Congress in 1932. Nobody had a radio. But Kinney's in Lismore, in the state, they had a radio. And she invited everyone to come and she put it on the window. But all the, oh, the crowd that came to, to listen to it. And they were Protestant, like, but she, she invited everyone to come. To, cause she, they were the only ones that had a radio. When I got to a certain age, yeah. that you were going dancing. Yes, tell me about that. We used to cycle to Kiltarmer, which was 10 miles, and dance until 2 o'clock in the morning. Cycle back home. You could, well, that time now I'd be 70, maybe 16. And a crowd of us would go. Yeah. Because the local kids would go. At that, round that age cycle, and yeah. as I said, um, you'd, you'd uh, you dance all night, and, and but you couldn't stay in bed then all day, you'd have, the next day, you had to be up early. <laughs> and how much was it to get into the dance, I think, can you remember? Uh, usually two shillings. Two shillings? Yeah. And what would you do to get the money to go to the dance? I, I, they'd always be able to, they'd always have it, they'd, they'd give you the money to go to yeah. the dance. Yeah. You were lucky in the sense that you yeah. were able to... Not all the time now would they have it like. We'd always have to make up the price, well, nine Sunday nights out of ten, I suppose, but make up the price to dance between the streamers. I might have the extra couple of shillings tonight and <laughs> someone else would have it the following week and we ended up with beyond recycling them and we'd go to Kilimer most and then we started going to Kiltarmer and Kiltarmer open. We cycled the banner a couple of times at Quigley's Hall. But now we're seven PJ did anyway, I think. So you mentioned you went to Quigley's, was it? And where, where else would you go for dances around? The Quigley's Hall in Bedouin used to go out. Yeah, the Marquis's Inch Tartar. Later yeah, on yeah, in the years, yeah. we used to go to them. And the you used, used, used to have local plays in the airport, and the hall in the airport, they used to play. You know, the local people had do themselves. Who was good at the drama? I wasn't good, but I used to. You were Danish. I, I loved to be backstage in this, you know, for half an hour. But. It was, you know, it was very enjoyable. We used to start going to the Cayley dances first and then we'd uh, go to modern dancing, as they call it. That's no. right. And we all just go in and get Cayley lessons on how to do Cayley dancing. And Quigley's Hall and Banagher. 
Vi tar nu går stories när man får ni bli fri till kapten dom så går till bed efter hela det får går stories. Jo vad? Det är inte bed. People, det var främmande hos vad de kallar. De nära de kommunen, de blir allt det var de de tim, de blir allt talkande och allt de stories det kom upp. You know, talking about this let's or that, and someone else saw something else, and so we'd be afraid to go. We'd be only children here and all day. We'd be afraid to go up to the room and get with the ghost. <laughs> and they'd meet such a thing in the road, and they saw such a thing. Oh, look. <laughs> uh, there was a cinema in Banner as well, wasn't there? Was. There was. Yeah. And there was one in Aircourt. There was one in Aircourt. They have it every Sunday night up in where... The, big, where the big building in the square there, you know, it's a uh, big stone building. <coughs> Out from Banner once a week with the film, to show films in it. And one night they were out, Mick Kelly, who lives in the Lee now, where one of the Rileys lives now, he used to go every night and I told everyone to tell the wife to the continued one, so that he gets an excuse to go back the next night. But one night he was in it, it was a cowboy. And he was sitting up near the stage, and I had to go up to the foot of it. And the horse was going galloping and galloping. He let up and roared, go back, go back, go back. He thought I was going to come out and tap him. See, for by the dozen, I remember Mammy bringing me to watch it, whatever, I forget what it was like. I forget. I was young. And it was in that place, in the little theatre in the square. Yeah. Cheaper by the dozen. Well, maybe because there was a whole lot of us in it, I <laughs> <laughs> I know where the theatre is in, in Aircourt. Yeah. I remember going to a, a picture there, and it was Nelly Kelly was the name of the picture. I still remember it. Nelly Kelly. Well, Michelle and the Larkins and Tommy Riley in Airport had a, had a band call for a few years when we were younger, like back in the 20s, we'll call it. They were only locally, like we never went too far. Well, maybe Paul was there a concert or in a hall or... Mm -hmm. Not dance, maybe. Well, I used to have a guitar or something. I never got great in it, like, to like everything else you'd want to study and time I had to get in on it. I'd have chords, like, but I wouldn't call myself good at all, like. Tommy Riley had a guitar and Noel Orchon had a bass guitar. I heard that didn't last that long, like, but it was all right, I'm sure. Mm. Something to keep our minds occupied, to better than, than making cows all the time. <laughs> we used to go to Mealy nearly every Sunday. Matter of fact, I have a picture there of myself and Bernie Briscoe outside the Mealy Church. But sometimes we'd walk down, let a good, what, three, four miles. Mm. But there'd be a lot out from Aircourt walking too, they'd walk out from Aircourt. Mm. And we'd just lie on the banks chatting, and that'd be when there'd be really fine weather. Mm. Oh, another thing we had was a regatta every year. Oh, the regatta was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. They came for miles to the... I, every year, every year, those boat races, there was... Um, they had ducks, and they had to try and catch the ducks. There was also uh, what was known as the greasy pole. It was a pole that was greased, and they had to walk out across it. You know, see how far they could go. <laughs> and there was a girls' race as well. There were girls. They, they, there was a ladies' race, I meant to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was a great, like, community day out. Everyone it, came around to Exactly, it. exactly. The community of Aircourt was a thriving place at one stage. There was three butchers, two drapery shops, a bicycle shop, the Kinneys used to do taxi, so did Quirks, he done taxi. The post office, of course, there was the post office. We didn't have a chemist at that time. A draper shop, as they call it, a draper shop in the town, Brendan Cohen. And you'd go in and he'd give you the pattern book and you'd pick out what pattern you want and then he'd measure you. And got, that's the way you got the soap, man. You'd never go in and buy it off the peg, as they say. Mm. There was a um, furniture shop. What? Yeah. The house was the furniture store. That He sold everything. Everything. Beds, all this, wardrobes, all that type of thing. There was Daly's, who, who was Neil's afterwards. 
dailies. Duffy's, they were there for years and years. Claire, me, Clerks, Clerks is there. Uh, um, Quirks was where Erner's was. And there was a Clerks, a different Clerks in where Mackler's pub was. So it was a really, really, I don't know how many sweet shops was in it. Higgins's was, um, I also seen a sergeant and a guard Boland, a guard Malone, and a guard Spillon. Three of them? Three guards and a sergeant. A sergeant in the village of Airport? In the village of Airport. Oh because crime that was committed at that time was to ha not having a light on your bicycle. <laughs> and I remember those three of us coming home one night and we were coming up and my light was gone. And when we coming up at Mitchell's lane where they were, when we were new to the girl, he said, where's your light? So we stayed going. <laughs> it wasn't too bright either, but some time after, some evening after I was in town and Gerard Malone said, why didn't you stop the other night when I called you? Every shops and pubs, wasn't it? Every one of them that were were shops, you had the hats and you had Kilwins and you had Brennan's and you had the post office and Burns's and Kinney's. I was on that side. And then you had Nealon's, that was Daly's that time, and Duffy's and Violet Horgan. Do you remember Violet? <laughs> I do. And Clark's. Quirks and Hindis. But like all the services that were there when people had no money. Do you know? And now there's money and there's nothing. Do you know the post office is gone? They'd be told three girls in their court and the post office and the bank had come a couple of times a week to the town. There was everything. And now there's nothing. When people have money, it's a kind of upside down, isn't it? Everything is gone to the post office is gone, the guard barracks is gone, the pubs, how many shops are closed in the place? There's only the one shop left in it now. I suppose we'll have a pub by Christmas. Fairs on the street, and to be fair in Killeen, we're in the fair in Banner. Every month. Every month. And there was no school the fair day. That was only day we got off, fair day, and the streets would be. The lambs would be pinned on the footpath, or the sheep, and the cattle would be in. Every man would have two or three cattle to sell, and they'd be, that's the way they'd be making a bargain, and they'd be slapping their hands that time. Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, the deal would finish up in the pub. I was with you for the lambs, the, yeah. the sheep fair, and they'd have all the pins up. And, and the footpaths all along each time. And towards lines is on the lane there. And they'd have them again. From from outside by these horgans there, with all dirty business there, and again below on the square, and above a more above a manion's corner. So that was on every year a sheep, a sheep fair, but I never heard about that before. No, there was a sheep. There was a fair every month, per one. I think. It was the third of January, the eighth of April, the fourth of March, the third of February, third of May. There was none in June, the tenth of July, tenth of August, the eighth of September, thirteenth of October and uh, the 10th of November and the 13th of December. I remember walking cattle to, 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 and to band the store to the fairs. And would you put them on, 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 on halters or would you...? Oh, no. Oh, no, I remember, and I, I went to Johnny Horseman a few times now. He brought 20 cattle to band the store. And he sold 10 of them. I went to bring home the, the, the other 10 that even, walked them back again. Everybody knew what they wanted for the cattle. But the, it was said now, whether it's the truth or not, Bordens in Lisbeg had a big estate. The gentleman of the estate would come in and he'd bid the farmers for their cattle. And he'd just say to them, if, you're, if you don't sell on the day, bring them down to my yard the next morning. And he'd buy them up. But every farmer sort of, and the farmers were very shrewd at the time. They, all they knew, knew the, the price of the, the value of their cattle. Indeed. 
But yeah. then you'd see them just spend, could spend an hour, we'd say, someone would come along and bid you for the cattle. And there'd be another fella trying to make the deal, you'd say, which at that time for cattle, 50 or 60 pounds, was it not? Like that. And they'd come back and there'd be five pounds between them and they'd say, I would divide it and make it some bring it up to him and this would go on for hours. He might move off then and some other fella come in and maybe he'd be you less or more or the man that's so horse fair now is a terrible place for blockers. You come along and you bid me for the horse. And you give me some and then you had this what's called blocker. He'd be standing looking and when you'd be gone, he'd come in and he'd bid me less for the horse and run down the horse and tell you the horse is this and that. But he'd be putting in trying to make it easier for you to buy the horse. That went on a lot. But they'd be coming in, the farmers would be coming in maybe a few days or a week before the fairs and they'd be putting down pegs when they'd be where they put down their pen when they come in with the sheep and they mark the pen but no one if I came in this evening put down the pegs for the along by the footpath, Tony come at when he wouldn't. Oh there was one farmer I saw he pulled up the pegs at one time and he put down a pen and the other farmer came in and it was out the lane here and there was holy head in the morning. <laughs> Uh, I mean, he made him take up the pin and take up and move back up here to go to way yeah, out yeah. of the near the town you had the better chance you had the buyers of mark come out from the village and the change was so slow like that you had a remark with the northern me in mm. when you be living in the one spot all the time or the one area rather mm. but your big corporations or anything that's worth owning now big corporations own them even this country, we don't know who owns what. So there are foreign corporations or companies that own them. Anything that's worthwhile in this country that's making money is sold to foreigners. Mm -hmm. So even those houses and estates built in around the cities, are just, as soon as they're built, there's, or before they're built, I suppose, there's some oh, corporation oh. coming in and buying up big blocks of the houses and renting them out as huge rents. In. That's the part of the government. That's the part of the let them do it. Well, I suppose the only thing is now the biggest change you see is one time everyone knew their neighbour and we're in out the neighbours. Now there's no, you, you don't know your next door neighbour, half them, you know, and there's no mixing backward and forward, like, you know, which I think is a terrible pity, like, you know. Well, whatever chance we had before COVID, I mean, we're finished now together. I, I bought an old combine. I, I went out for hire with the combine for two years and I decided to change it and buy a self-propelled one. But I bought the self-propelled one in Dublin and I drove it home all the way to Aircourt. And was I a happy man coming home with me, with me self-propelled combine? And it was the only one knocking around self-propelled. That was that. I finished with the self-propelled and I th think I bought an old den or something. and. So that was it, and I got married to Christina, and we lived out in Prospect, and Arab we were as happy as Larry. And, and then Mike got married, and we moved in here to the square. Well, I went out like I'd, I'd go on a job or something. As a matter of fact, I nearly went to a, a shop when I was 16 or 17 at the time. In Ballygare, right the Ballygare, I was supposed to be going to go to it, but it fell through anyway. It, was, it didn't happen, in other words. It was, mm. I'd sooner if I had walked out there and I'd have my own life to live. live. What's the other talker now? Anyway, was, I wouldn't do the same thing again, in other words. Yeah, I was about 17 when I went to England. My sister was there, okay. Kathleen. It's just, I went over with her in August to stay till Christmas. She'd be coming home at Christmas. And then I liked it that well. I worked in Lines' tea shops for okay. years, yeah. Okay. Absolutely loved it. Loved England when I was there. So I ended up, that's where I met my husband. I was only a week there when I met him. You were only a week there? A week there when I met him. Ah. And he used to go on a Sunday night to the workman's club. 
Okay. Then there was a lady's choice set on you had you could ask somebody that had asked you. So I was sitting down, I wouldn't ask anyone because I knew nobody. And this voice beside me said, Are you not dancing? And I, I said, No, I just did, don't know anybody here anyway. So the conversation went from there and I could find I could talk to him. Mm. I could chat away to him like very comfortably. So that was the start of the romance. And, and to the great employment, I would know there's not the work. You know, but in old days there was very little work, for, for women especially. You had to go off to, to get work. But you know there's work everywhere, isn't there? Mm. Well, <laughs> most places, Benish Low, Galway, and you can travel places. Mm. I rode in a pint of pint up here. My older brother bought a horse to be good enough to drive under a trap and, and I don't know, the kidneys or someone got on to my brother to put him into what he's called the confined race, just confined to members of the hunt. First race to ride in and everything. I finished second anyway. Some but I, I don't know, was he home from New Zealand or he had a brother in New Zealand and he was looking for some young fella to go over to hunt the hounds with him, to train him into be a huntsman or something. I'm sure I jumped to this idea of going over riding horses in New Zealand. I didn't know where it was. And of course, all hell broke loose. I wasn't going to be allowed. I suppose all right. I was too young to go off there. And, and when I opened the Sunday Press, I there was an ad on it. Grange Gorm was looking for young, as to go into train as male nurses. So I applied for it. That was, I applied for it. I was just turned 18 now at this time, I think. Started working on it, but I was terrified. I was never happy. In it. I was terrified. So I came home. I was preparing to go to the states in, and I, I remember Val writing to me and telling me not to come out for a while. I'd be only conscripted when I'd go out straight away. Then I met my good wife there. And You're doing better, right, Dana? And the factory over the road, Green Eyes, started. Well, it was ever fresh at that time. When I was over the factory, we got married, we bought here. But I knew there was a crowd from up Mount Mary for something doing the distribution and they weren't happy with them, they weren't selling what they should be selling. So if I had the courage when I started, if I, the, I found out after, if I had the courage, to, well, I didn't have the courage or the money, I suppose, put two or three trucks on the road, I could have taken in half the country at the time because it was only coming on the market, the frozen foods. First thing I'd look for when I went into a shop to see had their freezer that I could ask them to buy frozen food. And to ask them to buy fish fingers. How in the name of God did you have fish fingers? Frozen fish fingers? They didn't know what they were. It was a hard go and I worked seven days a week for a long time, I suppose. And except Madeline had her, had her ups and downs, but we survived so far anyway. My father brought the farm from 50 years to 71 acres. You have to have an ambition, and, yeah. and I, my goal was to go over and bring it to 100. But I brought it to 150, almost 150. Hmm. And what did you like to do, Mary? Or what I wanted to be a hairdresser, and I had to pay money to get me to learn it, and that finished that. <laughs> the money wasn't there. <laughs> mm. And what so, did you, sorry, go on. Then I went into Banner in town. Where it's super values now. And I was working in the shop, but I'd have to work for two years, serving me time, no pay. And I'd finish in the evening there and I'd go into the bear. I hated the bear. I liked the shop all right. So then I had got my appendix, so I'd had a bit out. And I didn't go back. I said, I might as well work at home for nothing, as work for them for nothing. <laughs> then we to send Bridget Seen after that. But it was good time off and the money was good. But it was well earned. And did but you miss work when you finished? No, I was glad to get out. I was recycling up and down to Well, I wished to stay in, but when you'd be off, then you'd come home. Your husband then, Mary, how did you meet him? Oh, I met him through Tom, didn't I? That's right, to Tom and him were padded around. Uh, and they used to come up to him, Dan Galvin's rambling, and that's how we met. Mm. It went from there. <laughs> was it love at first sight? I think it was. <laughs> <laughs>
Tell you I was in St. Bridget's Forkin. We'd <laughs> been at quarter to quarter past eleven every night. That was hard. Mm-hmm. Nothing easy. That's where we went. <laughs> yeah. My father had an old car and we were able to drive to the dances. And 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 uh, I didn't go far for a wife. I only went up the road to my to Christina's place. How did you meet? Who who asked who out for how did I you went, <laughs> Because I asked her out. I asked her out. Okay. I think where were you at that time, Christina? In fact, was it? You were in fact, but the Marquis was it? Then you went to Dublin, okay. and we used to go to Dublin. I go to Dublin that time. As I said, John, uh, my father had an old car, and I go up to Dublin. And you could park the car uh, at that time with the side of the footpath, John, in Dublin, and that was that. Mm. Uh, I was a straw man. I was a straw <laughs> man, John. I, we were great for eight or nine years, and I eventually got married. And we were very happy. We had two kids, by a girl, Michael and Paula, and she... Uh, what I have to say about my wife is she has an endless patience now. She'd never, I never, I never come in yet that she'd say something, she'd jump at me, you know what I mean by jumping at you now. So when you got older then, did you stay around or did you move away? Oh, I went to Dublin. I was working in a little shop first and then the war came and things went... Everything got scared. Then I went to work in the house. I was cooking in the house there for five years. Yeah, that was grand. Came home then and married to Marion. <laughs> but it was on and off now for a good while. That's the way it was. On and off. <laughs> and what much into him in the beginning. <laughs> he grew on He grew on me. Much <laughs> Did he go up to fetch you in Dublin or did you? No, I came down in the tree and her bus or something. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't know, do, would you come home at the weekends much, Myra? Oh, will you stop? Yeah. <laughs> Were you weekend, Doctor? What was the weekend? <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, and were you long courting then before you got married? Oh, I must be 10 years. <laughs> you the same as well. I said something. On and off. Ten years before you before you got married to the poor creature. <laughs> that was a good a good time. But not it? Mm. It was well so stout. <laughs> but when she he was down here and I was up there. We was in the mess. <laughs> there were different times. You would be going up to Dublin every weekend or <laughs> that often. We came home once a year. And you had to be in at 10 o'clock at night. You lived in. And I thought he was a vet. A great man of She had no social life, a kind of, in Dublin. It was great around here, though. You, you were all with everyone mixing and going to this, that, and the other. Me and me, she had our dances or the play or something. We'll put we'll them on another long leg in. <laughs> and then he, he enticed you to come back down to Clownbridge. He did. <laughs> Don't you say it was love? <laughs> she wanted to get her toe. She was being held. Held a bit. The secret to a good marriage. No, there was no anniversary cards. Birthday cards, no. I might get a Christmas card when the kids were older, the girls were old enough to get the card and get him to put his name on it. But then things weren't important to me, the, you know, it was, and we could, to the day he died, I could see talk or two. We could see on each side of the fire, as we used to say, and chat away. Companionship. And when I hear people saying about the lockdown, and their husband or wife was under their feet so much, it was the cause of a break up. You know, the sad difference. Yeah, but I was lucky, maybe I was very lucky. Oh, as I said, you couldn't argue with him because he'd go off whistling, like he'd go, and I said to him, I wouldn't mind if you could sound so whistling. <laughs> yeah. 
I so two years and then you got married. We got you were married. over there. Yeah. And how many did you have in family then, Nancy? We had three. Three. We, we had four actually. Had Our you? eldest yeah. girl died at four. Oh, Brain yeah. hemorrhage, yeah. Oh, that's terrible. I mean, it was explained Till and John there this morning. Well, we had four kids. Well, only two of them left now. And one of them was, he was only three and a half. He was killed out there on the street, just between here and the post office, I'd say. And one Saturday morning, I was gone off selling frozen foods, and the car hit him. And the other daughter died up in Leeds, what, 11 years ago now. She had three young kids. And Cancer with Lehman dear to left. So that was hard to take, but we had to take it as well. That was very hard, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard, but then I had two babies as well, like Jimmy was only nine months and Brenda was two year and three months. So you had to get on with your life and for their sake you couldn't be. You had to get on with life, and yeah. it was tough. You'd never forget it, like. Yeah. Have, have you have have you got family of your own then, and, or how many how many kids have you got? Or what? Uh, we, I have six. Miriam, it's four. Is it? I had four. I had four. She had four. One died. Yeah. Yeah. I had seven. Six boys and a girl. I had eleven. And what, how, how many girls and boys which, how many of which? Six girls and five boys. Many five girls now, one of them died there a few three years ago. Oh, Sunny Coleman three years ago. You might remember it. She lived over in Mulya. That's harder than any, any relation dying, even your husband. You could say that to a wife, and just... Yeah, no, 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 they say that burying a child is the hardest oh, it thing. Is. It is. Can you imagine how you're with your two now? Yeah. God bless them. Well, you see, in my day, you were very, very innocent. Oh my God, you were in. When I look back now, yeah. that's when I look back on how naive I was. Yeah, we were talking about that if you were asked in school, who, who made you? And you're supposed to have the answer, God made you. But there's never a word about where you came from or how you got into it. Well, you were, you were found in the reef straw or you were found under a head of cabbage. The, the, the oldest children in the house would know where the other children were coming from, like, mm. obviously. Mm. But, as far as myself and Seamus went, we were never told anything. So we knew nothing, and we know that. And it's a God compared to now. Look at what was it in, he said. I wonder he had a cabbage. <laughs> That's it, it was kind of kept for me, had to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> the hard work. <laughs> we, we, we had two bikes to Paula, and it was easy, real. So was, I think the way he was he used to go to the discos. Is that right, Christina? They go off in the car. The Mike and Paul were easy. Where there was all the children in the town, the Jaisers and the Duffies. But, but but now, my God, my God, my God. It, it is very hard now. It's a different kettle of fish now. Yeah, yeah, okay. You're new to the job when you start off. Every parent. Definitely, does do their very best. Always talk to your children. Never talk down to them. Just talk to them. You know that's all I could. That's all I ever did. Enjoy them when they're small. Yeah. Because they're grand then, you know, and the, the things that come out of and the say and everything, you know, they're great. Even the, the, babies are wiser. They're. They're not babies. Yeah. They're not yeah. babies for long at no. all now. No. They're not like baby we <laughs> You used to have. So I said to say to me, we were stupid when we were young. <laughs> well, we're stupid now compared to what they were. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, not at all. Oh, so they great. <laughs> but you see, they're broad places now and they see more yeah, people. Yeah. And yeah. You see, when they were born one time, you had no 
cairn, you know, nothing to bring them anywhere. And, and you think when you had them all there were around the kitchen to all, you think you'd never see it in the top. <laughs> five or six in the morning. I'd never get the one side. Well, you would. But the next one's gone. I tell you, I enjoy them. Even teenagers, you know, it's, it's tear and parents. You know. Enjoy them when they're small. Yeah. And I was told that. Yeah. They're told. And, and I said there must be bad times ahead. <laughs> and my dad, she was right. You think you're not worrying, but you know, yeah. if something, you see something or does someone seek after, it mm. comes back to you. Mm. No matter what the age? No matter what the age, it doesn't matter. No. No. Mm, that's it, that's it. You're still a child. <laughs> you know. You're mm. still yours. Yeah, yeah. You know. What I do admire is the dads. Because they take part in rearing the child. <laughs> do everything now. <laughs> my, mom, my mother asking, Asking me father, when I was a, uh, I don't know why, that little small man, she said, will you hold her for, I know I can't, she might fall through my fingers. He, she, he wouldn't even hold me when she was doing something. <laughs> that was, that was the answer she got. I would do it again. I'd probably try and get married anyway and have a house of my own, we'll call it. I know I had a house of my own here, but to... Have a family of your own, that sort of way. I have two regrets. Right? Yeah. One was, I never learned to drive. And the other one was further education. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you had done those. I wish I'd done them things. Them two things. That's the only, that's the only regret I have, thank God. I left school last. At 14, mad to stay at home. And my poor old father and mother wanted me to go to with secondary school. But I wasn't too good at the figures and I didn't go. But I was sorry, quite honest about it. I was sorry afterwards. I, I'd like to have been a dressmaker. I was very fond of sewing. And that's why I'd like to have been, but I couldn't get in any for you. There was a few in Benner all right. He thought it might take me on as a. a you know, an apprenticeship or whatever you call it. But no, none of them had the vacant there. I remember Elizabeth Long, she's born. You, you'd have no choice of clothes. Do you know, well, then you couldn't travel any for the press banner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't, it was scarce enough. That's why I'd like to be it. And I like air, and I like sewing, and I like knitting. I used to go be knitting. That was it. I suppose as time goes by, you don't realise like you go from one day, one week, or month to the other, and time goes by. It's what's your life? like, and the next thing the year starts flying, <laughs> a year of nothing now. No, that way. But you don't feel the years go. It's like a flash. To me, no, it's like a flash. That's all it's like. Send me the pillow that you dream on Don't you know that I still care for you? Send me the pillow that you dream on So darling, I can dream on too Each night while I'm sleeping or fall only I share your love and dreams that once were through Send me the pillow that you dream on, so darling, I can dream on too. I waited so long for you to write me, but just the memories all I've left of you. Send me the pillow that you dream on, so darling, you can dream on too. Send me the pillow that you dream on. Maybe time will make my dreams come true. Send me the pillow that you dream on. So darling, 
I can dream on it too. Each night while I'm sleeping, I'll follow me. I share your love in dreams that once were true. Send me the pillow that you dream on, so darling, I can dream on it too. So darling, I can dream on it too. Thomas, thanks very much for uh, for. I know what I sound like. I know you sound perfect. <laughs>